Let me see your Bibles. Textbooks in the air. Okay, electronic Bibles. Well done. Well, well done. Turn with me, please, to the book of John. I'm going to dovetail with last week's message just a little bit, using in part the same story but a different slant. John chapter 6. How many just like problem solving? Crossword puzzles? Puzzles. Word games. What's, what's that thing where you go and they lock you in a room and you got to use the clues to get out? What's that called? Escape room. How many of you like escape rooms? Okay. How many of you can't stand problems? You just soon pay somebody else to, to do your problem. Y'all were probably the bullies in school. <laughs> I'll pay you to this test. John 6, chapter 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs that he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. So when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? I mean, it's like this. You're at home, and you're having hot ham and cheese and some chips. And you happen to look up, and you see a train of cars coming towards your house The people are coming to surprise you with a surprise visit. And you know good and well, this is the kind of family that don't bring no food with them. You know what I mean? And so you're looking at your spouse saying, what what are we going to do to feed them? Yeah, lock the door. (laughs) So he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. So Philip answered him. Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each to even have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But. <laughs> no. Uh, re- remember when we first started the preglow? You have this terrible problem. But you see a cloud about that big. And so you have 5,000 mouths to feed. And one disciple says, we got five barley loaves and two fish. But how many times have you prayed? Lord, I know you're able, but this is bad. God, I I know you could do this if if you just had your hankering that you wanted to, but... Lord, I know what your word says, but I just feel like that word but cancels everything. That's like looking at your wife or your husband and saying, I really love you, but, and they're like, you know, they, they perk up like, what's after that, right? Because you just canceled out the whole I love you part. Five barley loaves, he said. And two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. And Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. He didn't say, here's your ration, as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all that they wanted to eat, or had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over and let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten 
And after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come to the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Can you imagine how many's ever stayed after one of our potlucks to help clean up? How many's ever done that? Okay. That's with about 100 to 120 people on a potluck. Can you imagine cleaning up after 5,000? And can you imagine how many pieces they had to pick up amongst 5,000 men to equate 12 baskets? I don't think they just found one table that they had excess and collected 12. I think they had to go throughout this whole hillside and pull from each group to collect the 12 baskets full. I think that's a powerful principle because God is saying, don't let anything be wasted. God, help me right now. There are some of you in this room right now that feel as though that you are the leftover crumbs. You're the leftover crumbs. You don't feel like you have any value. You're the leftovers. And the Lord sent the apostles back into the crowd and said, you go, don't you let anything be wasted. And if God feels that way about barley bread and fish, imagine how he feels about you and I. He wants none of us None of our lives, none of our skills, none of our experiences, none of our gifts, none of our calls, none of our anointings, none of, none of the things that he's planted in us, he wants none of it to go to waste. We had men's group the other night, and we used some metal disposable pans, and we had some taco meat, and another one that had a bunch of uh, ranch Ranch style beans. I love me some ranch style beans. And uh, so it had grease and sauce and stuff in the pan. And I forget who it was that came up to me and said, hey, should we toss this or wash it? Think about that. It's a disposable pan. The initial reaction is toss it. But I looked at it and I thought, that's a fine looking pan. It just has some sauce and grease on it. Wash that bad boy. We'll use it again. And then when I read this, go pick up the pieces. I don't know about you, but I'm bad about leftovers. I'm bad about leftovers. Somebody get a sandwich, take a big old bite of it, and say, oh, I just can't eat this no more. They wrap it up and stick it in the fridge. I ain't touching that. And yet this is pieces of bread and pieces of fish. I don't like whole fish, much less pieces of fish but yet god found enough value in it that he sent his disciples amongst five thousand to get it so this story begins with something real beautiful and something that we're really familiar with i'm not talking about the miracle the miracle is obviously an a plus plus i'm talking about the problem who ever thought that a problem was a beautiful thing Problems are beautiful things. Their problem was having over 5,000 hungry people and nothing to feed them. I don't know about you, but when I'm facing a, a big issue and a big problem, I typically don't look at it and go, wow, isn't this a wonderful, glorious thing for the Lord to show up? At? That's just not part of my consideration. It needs to be, but I've not been greatly successful at doing that thus far. So what I usually see is, well, here's another demand. Like, there's another thing that I need on my plate. Like, let me see if I can just spin another plate on this thing. And you see what I'm saying? It's, it's like there's, there's another thing that demands time. I want you to think about this. Jesus, we've got five loaves and two fish that we stole from this kid. So Jesus blesses it, breaks it, and passes it out. Now watch this. 
my mind is racing, okay? I don't think, and I, I said this the other day, I don't think Jesus broke, go, broke, go, broke, go, broke, go, broke. I don't think he kept breaking for 5,000 people. I think he said, come here, see how this works? Break it. You break it. So I think the 12 started spreading out, and they started breaking and giving. It's just my imagination, okay? You can't, you, you say, well, you can't prove that. You can't prove it didn't happen, okay? I'm just telling you what my, mind, what my mind thinks. Because even now, Jesus did things and said, greater works than these shall you do. Jesus is not showing up to do it all. Jesus is showing up to demonstrate how we can do it. He's trying to show us how it's done. I don't know about you, but I'd a whole lot rather learn hands-on how to fix something by somebody showing me than I would to have to go through illustrations and read all the, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't like that. Just take me to the car, show me a wrench, show me a ratchet, show me a screwdriver, show me what an alternator is and how to get it off and how to put it, I'll be good. I'm not going to, yeah. see figment B4, B4, see what this is. Just show me. So Jesus showed up and said, here's how you do it. See bread? Give thanks, break it, give it. Break it, give it, break it, give it. Now you go do that. That's really what needs to be happening in ministry. Oh, they need healing? Watch how this works. Father, thank you, heal them. Boom, gets healed. Okay, now you go do that. We don't. We're consumers. Got a friend of mine that coined the word consumerism. We're full of consumerisms. We need to heal him. Well, Lord, thank you. And we go home. And we consume that healing for ourselves instead of realizing that if he felt strong enough about investing a healing in our life and body, shouldn't we cultivate that to give thanks, break it, and heal somebody else, and, and heal somebody else? And, but we don't. We Watch this. We find one person who's learned how to give thanks and break it, and we'll go to them because we can see them instead of doing what they did. Mm-hmm. I see what kind of night we're in for. So Jesus and his disciples, after feeding over 5,000, they're now tired. And even though they're tired, he tells the apostles, now go clean up the mess and let's save all the pieces. So Jesus can't go to Jerusalem now for the Passover because he knows that the Jewish leaders are lying in wait for him. Oh, wow. This is free. As soon as I read that. There is either somebody or somebodies in this room right now that there are people that mean you ill will and harm that are lying in wait for you. But I really just believe in my, and, and knowing my knower, if you will just begin to praise the Lord, he will so shine a light on that, he'll expose it before you ever get there. I don't know who that's for. That's for somebody or somebody's. You catch what I'm saying? There's, there's, there's people lying in wait for you. They've set a trap. They, they want to bring harm or destruction or to steal or to whatever the case may be. But you begin to praise the Lord. And I don't mean just doing the bare minimum to say that you did. I mean praise him from your heart. The Lord will set ambushments on the ambush. He'll light it up so that you'll know what's going on. That thing will blow up before you ever get there. If you receive that, just wave at me. So he can't go to the celebration for Passover because he knows that they're waiting on him. But he loves it because he fully understands what it means. In fact, there's four Passovers in the book of John that date Jesus' public ministry in three years' time. John 2.13 was a few months into his ministry. John 5.1 was a year plus a few months. John 6.4, two years and a few months. And John 13.1, three years and a few months. And we know in John 2, Jesus drove out the money changers. Been having some conversations about that here recently. Jesus drove out the money changers out of the temple and had a terrible confrontation with religious leaders. And don't forget about the conflict that occurred after he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. 
So we know that the very next year when he goes to Jerusalem, that's when he's crucified, okay? So he knows if he goes to the Passover now, he's going to be killed a year early. And God's all about timing. So in obedience to the Father, he avoids that whole situation. Listen very carefully. Some of you carry the wisdom, the brawn, the thick skin, and all of that to deal with situations. And you know they're waiting on you, and you want to just show up just to make it happen. You're itching for a fight, and you know I can handle this. You kind of got a Samson thing going on. You know if you just show up, you can mop the floor with them. But there's a divine timing to what God is wanting to do because it's not all about you. It's also about them and giving them ample time to turn. There might be some people that's there today that wouldn't be there because God would have dealt with them if you would have just waited until he said go. Can I say it like this? Not everything about your ministry has to do with you. Oh, God. <laughs> Not everything about the ministry that you're called to even has to do with you. It has to do with your obedience because if you're really going to be faithful in the ministry to which God's called you to go, you've got to pray for who he says pray, avoid those he says avoid, go when he says go, stay when he says stay. We have to be completely obedient and submitted to the Father not thinking that we know enough and we can handle this and, you know, he's already empowered me, so let me just go get it done. There's a divine timing involved. Some of you wondering why the promotion has never occurred and why people haven't recognized you and why you're not seeing more things and more fruit happening in your ministry. It's because your time is jacked. You're trying to play in a symphony and the beat is like this and you're just all over the place. Timing is everything. Boy, there's a lot of parenthetical preaching going on tonight. So he obeyed the Father. Isaiah 42, verse 3. It says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. See, because we, if we were Jesus, we'd probably just show up to show how bad we were. <laughs> we'd have the angels appear just to make the people wet themselves, just to identify and to confirm and affirm to everybody who's there who I am. See, ministry is nothing to do with who you are. Ministry is everything to do with who he is. Ministry is like a, a seesaw or a teeter-totter. You guys remember those? Huh? Huh? And when you're in charge, Jesus is in the air. He can't do nothing. But when he's in charge, we're in the air. And we only do what he says do. Only one can be in charge. Too many people think that because they got the gift, the call, the anointing, and the opportunity, that God's got to do what they say. That's not the way it works. You still do what God says. Man, I feel like I'm dealing with, I'm preaching to preachers today. This is, this is kind of something along the lines I'd be sharing with, with ministers. So, Jesus sent out his disciples two by two in the ministry. And they came back with excited reports. Man, look at this. We got, this person's healed. This person got set free. This one got the devil's cast out of them. This is so wonderful. But the ministry team is exhausted. And so they crossed the Red Sea to find a place to rest, or I'm sorry, not the Red Sea, the, the Sea of Galilee. And as they're crossing, people recognize the boat that they're in, and so they start running after Jesus. So when they arrived to their resting place, the place, the little cabin that they wanted to be in, the little B and B, the little siesta, the little recreation place, <laughs> there's a lot of people that showed up that were following him. And so instead of resting, here goes Jesus, ministering again. He taught them the word of God, and he healed the sick. Now, catch this. They, they gave thanks. They broke the bread and fish. They fed 5,000. They cleaned up after the 5,000. They get on the boat to try to go find a place to rest. And when they get to the place they're going to rest, there's another crowd that's chasing them down. So they move back from the crowd to rest on a hillside and Jesus looks up, and here they come again. You guys remember when your kids were little? I mean, really little. And you and your spouse decided, listen, 
we just need a we just need a little time just to hang out by ourselves. So we're gonna we're gonna have a hot ham and cheese, some tomato bisque soup. We're gonna watch a movie, have a little ice cream. We just want a couple hours. So let's overdose that kid on Benadryl <laughs> and see if we can't get a little little rest. And about one bite into that sandwich, here they come. You know, big diaper just. That's how Jesus is feeling. He's done everything he knows how to do to take care of them, put them to bed, get, you know, get them resting. And then when he's just trying to, let me just catch a wink, here comes a crowd of them. Can I say it like this? There will never be a time when there will be no need for ministry. If you let it, ministry will wear you slick out. I'm not going to deal with that subject today, but I'm filing it for another day. So now they're, they're very, 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 very tired. So here's the problem. You've got 5,000 men. Matthew tells us that the number is besides women and children. Some estimate that there's an additional 20,000 besides the 5,000 5, men, the 20,000 in total. So it's an impossible situation. That's why I ask you how many of you right now in this room are having an impossible situation because Jesus did not immediately give a solution. How many is a little frustrated with the Lord right now because you haven't found the solution? Be honest. Raise your hands. Shame the devil. <laughs> Four of you. So I know I've been frustrated with God's timing. I've asked the Lord repeatedly, why, why, why has this not happened? Why has this not happened yet? Where's this at? You promised this and you promised that. Why am I not seeing this yet? So surely God knows that we've got a problem and we're asking for a solution. In John 6, 5, Philip, he says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, Jesus is playing a little bit of a trick on him because he already knows what the answer is. But he needs Philip to find out that there's not the answer that he hopes there is. So why does God allow you and I to be confronted with these big problems in our lives? How many of you feel like you're at a breaking point right now? You feel like, Popeye, I've had all I can stands and I can't stands no more. That's where you're at. Come on. Got the Popeye anointing going on. Look at that. How many ever heard about the old farmer? He said, uh, he was praying and he said, Lord, I'm not surprised that you have so few friends the way you treat the ones you've got. <laughs> the rest of y'all are sleeping. That was funny. So you got Philip sitting here thinking, why me? There's 11 other disciples here. Why are you picking on me? You know 7-Eleven is shut down. You know Walmart is in COVID mode and they close at 10 o'clock. You know I can't just run down. You know I can't Amazon this and have it in a couple hours. What do you mean asking me where are we going to go to buy all this stuff? You know there's no place to go. Ask Paul, ask, ask Peter, ask, ask anybody else. Why are you asking me? I want you to hear that following Jesus does not eliminate problems in your life. In fact, if you want to know the truth, it probably increases them. So what is God's purpose? To conform you and I into the image of his son. What's the image of his son? That we act like him, talk like him, walk like him, react like him, pray like him. Do the work of the ministry like him. So John 6, 6 is a full revelation of what God is doing in your life and in mine with problems. He asked Philip to test him. He wanted Philip to see that Philip was his own problem. God allows problems to come into our life to prove our inadequacies. How many, how many times have we got a problem and we, we try to solve it all by ourselves? We don't pray. We don't ask God. We don't find godly counsel. We just say, I got this. I'm going to figure this out. How many's done that? Come on. quit. Lying. There you go. Look at this. We don't even consider the fact that maybe God has allowed this to prove to us that we don't have what it takes because he wants us to lean on him. So what do you, what do, you do about it? Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? 
How about this one? How are we going to pay the mortgage this month? How can we get our teenager to make wise choices instead of stupid hormonal ones? How can I get along with that cranky person at work? See, the call for a solution is always ringing in our ears. Always. Just like that squeaking from that stupid fan on the AC right now. It's just screaming for a, for a bar of soap. We look for answers. Can I tell you what happens when we look for answers in the wrong places? How many knows what I mean when I say a loan shark? When you start looking for an answer and you run to the loan shark instead of to the Lord, they'll give you a solution that's not the right solution, but they'll charge you for the wrong solution and then command you to pay interest on it when it doesn't work. And for some reason, we don't have enough money to obey God, but we got plenty of money to pay these loan sharks. Maybe it's because we believe the loan sharks will do us more harm than God will ever do for us in blessing us. That's not supposed to be a one-liner. That's supposed to make us consider, who is it that has more sway and weight in our life? Is it the fear of what these loan sharks are going to do when we go to them and get a solution that we have to buy? Or are we going to take a solution that's already paid for in the Word of God and have success? Mm-hmm. Ultra quiet tonight. Philip is like, well, not like most of us. He's much better at defining the problem than solving it. So in John 6, 7, Philip responds to the Lord. He says, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have even a bite. He's basically saying, Jesus, I don't, I don't even have enough to, to give them a bite, let alone a whole meal. I don't have it. And that's what Jesus wanted Philip to realize. How many of you would consider yourself a rescuer? You see somebody in a jam, you just can't help yourself. you got to help them. Whether it's in money or fixing a, an appliance, a car, a, a relationship, or, oh my gosh, stranded animals. You just feel like you got to rescue these stupid cats and dogs and guinea pigs and rescuer. you got this rescuer mentality. See, what Philip could have said, maybe should have said, was, Jesus, I don't know how we're going to solve this problem, but I'm sure you'll come up with something. <laughs> Put it back on Jesus. We're, we're all wrestling to some extent with our own inadequacies. You know, most of us live our life in such a way that we, we shelter our inadequacies so other people don't find them out. Instead of us looking for people whose strength is our weakness and building a relationship and an alliance. So Andrew steps for, forward with a little something. He, said, he's, he had to laugh when he heard himself say it. We got a little boy here with five loaves and two fish. If you, if you look that up a little bit, you're going to find out these are not loaves like we consider a loaf. Like, how many ever been to Outback? You see that little loaf? Of, it's not even that big. Another, another word for loaf of barley here is biscuits. Maybe like Grandy's, no, that's too big. Maybe like KFC's biscuits. Five biscuits and two fish. Two little fish. What's a little fish? Maybe like sardines. Come on. So you got, you got five biscuits and a couple of sardines. Yeah, minnow. Sardines smell worse, though, so I'm going to use them. Barley is known as the poor man's bread. It was a byword for saying it's worthless, not worth a nickel. So these guys have got a big problem. Five biscuits, two sardines. And they're not coming up with great solutions. In fact, the one solution they did come up with, they already discounted but say, by saying, but what is such a little amount of food to so great a need? So Jesus has the solution. We've, we've adequately described the problem, but Jesus has the solution. So how does this problem get solved? I'm going to walk you through this miracle. The first thing that happens is the disciples are faced 
with their own inadequacies and humbled. I want to tell you something. You have not really been truthful with your own inadequacies until you're no longer prideful or arrogant about it. I don't know how many people I've talked to. Oh, I'm humble. I'm humble. God knows my heart. Yeah, God also knows your body language that's demonstrating a completely different attitude than what you're saying out of your mouth. You catch what I'm saying? You, you cannot be honest about the inadequacies in your own life if you have this, this prideful haughtiness about you. That you can't be wrong. You, 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 you can't give a, a bad salute. Am I making any sense to anybody? You, you, there's, there's just this attitude that goes with it. You know, the devil was the same way. And God said, yeah, you really are inadequate. And he says he fell from heaven like lightning to earth. In order for God's solution to be paramount in your life, you're going to have to be in a heart condition that will receive that. The greatest miracles come through, pe through people who are debased in themselves but lift up and exalt Jesus. Secondly, they had to give to Jesus what they had. <laughs> Can you imagine as a little kid you get... A five dollar allowance, and you've been you've been working, 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 working for something that costs twenty bucks, and it's taking you forever to amass twenty bucks. So your parents take you to the to the toy store, and you think I'm there. It's nineteen ninety nine. <laughs> Woo hoo! So you slap that twenty bucks down, and then it dawns on you that that's not going to be quite enough. So all of a sudden, your demeanor fails and you wad the money back up and you go to stick it back in your pocket and mom or dad says put that up on the counter and you go but it, it's it's not a, put it up on the counter you think you know what's going to happen but you're scared that you might be wrong so you don't want to assume so you pull that back out and you put it down on the counter and mom or dad throws another $10 on top of it and says, get it for the kid. This is what happens when we bring to the table what's far less than that. And we work so hard, but no matter how hard we work, it's never going to be enough to do what God's called us to do because what God has called us to do, we cannot accomplish without his involvement. You could work your whole life to amass enough money to pay for what you believe God has called you to do, and it will never be enough. You'd have been better off in the first year of that saying, Lord, this is all I got. And he says, great, I'll take that. Here's mine. It's paid for. Let's get it done. The problem is we get to be my age or older before we figure that out. And that's why I enjoy having people that are younger than me in here to say, don't wait until your hair is either turning gray or turning loose before you find out, listen, all I had to do was bring what I had because God knew I didn't have enough when he told me to bring what I had. I just had to be willing enough and humble enough to offer what it was that I did have. I'm going to let you in a little deeper in my life by saying it like this. The Lord is having to address me on how I view ministry. And I've come to the Lord saying, if I put my all in this, I believe that I have this in me. I can, I can attain from here to there, and I can do this for the Lord. The problem with that is, I've limited both myself and God because I didn't make him a part of that equation. The second thing is, God could care less how much I bring to the table as much as if I brought it to the table. Because God's call is far bigger than I can ever do on my own. So while I'm thinking this is the max I can ever do, God's plan for me is way up here, and I've never allowed myself to mentally ascend to that because it would only bring me to depression And yet God is trying to prove to us that the only way that we're ever going to be effective for him and in the kingdom is if we partner with him. Watch this. We don't partner with him to do what we could do on our own. 
we partner with him to do what we're incapable of doing on our own. Okay, maybe that was just for me. So thirdly, they obeyed Jesus' directive as to what to do next. So John 6, 10, he says, have the people sit down. Why was it important that the people sat down? When, uh, when Rachel's grandmother was a bit younger than she is now. How old is she now, babe? She's not in here? 95, 96. So when she was in her 70s and we'd go over for Thanksgiving or Christmas, she wouldn't even eat until everybody had their plate and was halfway done. And then at the end of the meal, she was the one cleaning. And so it got to the point where you just have to tell her, Grandma, sit down. Well, I will. No, you'll sit down now because none of us are going to take another bite until you sit down to eat. Why? Because she can't work when she's sitting. Y'all need to hear this. Jesus knew that all these people is going to have their own ideas. Well, I know we can do this, and well, if we pull our money together, maybe we can, you know, have a drone send us some food. Right? So he said, just tell everybody to sit down. And so when they sat down, now they're in receive mode. Oh, God. Uh, let me try this side. Sometimes we just have to sit down in order to be in receive mode. We want to come to Jesus standing up and, and, and you know, all erect. And here I am, Lord, and use me. And, and God is looking for those that are humble in heart, humble in spirit, humble in mind, humble in every aspect of their being. And sometimes we just have to sit down in order to receive from the Lord. Oh. The other thing is he wanted order. You guys know how hard it is to take attendance with just this group of people? You guys are like popcorn. This has got to go to the bathroom. This one's going to get sent out to go get some water. This one, this one, you know, their legs fall asleep, so they got to move. This one's got a baby that's crying. This one's got, so you got all, the, just all throughout the service, it's just like popcorn, just people popping all over the place. So if you're trying to, at some point, I think mom just wants to go, would y'all just be still? <laughs> right? Because as long as we're moving, it's very, very difficult to get anything done. And that's what Jesus, he said, listen, we need order. And the only way I'm going to have order is to disengage you so I can be engaged. So sit down. Okay? Number four, in verse 11, Jesus exemplified an important principle in this miracle process. He looked up toward heaven to the Father, and he gave thanks. Guys, he just didn't do this in his heart. He did this publicly. He publicly acknowledged God's goodness and provision. What provision? The provision that they didn't yet see. The provision from a store that's not open. He publicly acknowledged his dependence on the Father, and he thanked God for what little he had. <laughs> He thanked God for what little he had, and then he dedicated it to the Lord, and then he used what he had. We just look what's in our hand, and we go, well, I said enough to get the job done, so I'll, I'll keep working to provide so that I will get the credit because I did this. It was my doing. God's never going to let that succeed. Because the whole idea of us having not enough is to prove that he's more than enough so that our partnership together will be more than sufficient for the problem at hand. Problems are meant to expose the hand of God in our life. Again, problems are meant to expose the hand of God in our life. The devil's working so hard to discourage people, to isolate people, to depress people, to make people upset and angry and division and all this stuff. Problems are a gift from God to expose our inadequacies so that we can see that he's the overachiever. I 
Honestly, if we never needed another dime for the rest of our life, we were financially sufficient. Most of us would die without Jesus because problems keep us debased enough that we're constantly looking for God's involvement. I believe that's why the Bible says there won't be that many rich people in heaven. Not because that wealth is a sin, but because they find themselves so, self so self-sufficient that they don't look for God's involvement. Number five. The disciples were involved in this miracle. You and I tend to err on one of two extremes, one side or the other. One, one extreme is to simply try to solve the problem without God. I got this. Lord, you have a seat this time when he's trying to have us have a seat. The other extreme is, is to want God to work some sort of miracle so we don't have to get our hands dirty. So either we want to do it all or not at all. And God wants our involvement because he's trying to build our confidence, not in who we are, but in who he is in us. So the problems that are coming in our life are impossible for us to do correctly without him. He is the missing piece. It's like a two-key lock. One key slides into the other key and it makes one key. And that key opens the door. Not that God couldn't do it without us. God chooses not to do it without us because he wants desperately our involvement so that we, we realize our dependence upon him and his limitless supply. Problems are a gift to make us reach out to and receive from God. I believe that in the same way that we look to God for being the answer, God's answer, more times than not, includes you and I as an, as an ingredient to that answer. God is making us a part of the solution. Number six, the miracle did not stop when the need was fully met. Everybody got full and there was still leftovers. And then God said, the leftovers are just as much a provision as the provision itself. So honor God who gave the provision by honoring him by picking up the remnants so nothing is wasted. He basically told him, go get a doggy bag. I want you to hear that when God solves your problem, it won't be half solved. When God solves a problem, it will, be, it will be solved, and he won't stop until the job is done. You know, when, when the children of Israel found themselves at the Red Sea, they didn't swim across. They walked. When the walls of Jericho came down, they didn't come down halfway, so they didn't have to jump as high. They came all the way down. And here, when you had five biscuits and two sardines, they had 12 baskets full left over. I went and played with a, a pastor friend of mine for the first time. Anybody ever played disc golf before? Frisbee golf, disc golf? Who has? Who liked it? Okay. So I found out there is a lit course and mustang so you can play at night oh yeah that's happening so he takes me out to the course and i'm learning how to throw because this don't always get the job done so now i'm doing this sidearm stuff and using different discs and they're you know you got a putter disc you got a driver disc you got a mid-range disc and then you got all different kinds it, it, it's it's uh, psh. so learning how to to do all this stuff and uh, I just bought this starter kit, but I thought I did really good because they sent me two full sets of discs. So I got six discs. I'm thinking, how many am I going to need? It's great. So I show it to him. He goes, man, that's really good. That's really good. Are you ready to go? I said, yeah. So he reaches in the back of his truck, and he pulls out this ginormous backpack. And, I mean, you open that thing up, and it is wall to wall. I mean, 
filed by, by color, by driver, by putter, by all this stuff. I mean, he probably had 30, 40, 50 discs in there. And so I'm using this starter stuff, and it's doing an adequate job, but it ain't getting the job done. So he says, here, try this one. I think you really like this one. And, man, I can make that one sing really good. I thought, this is awesome. Well, if you, how many ever played golf golf? How many of you find that your ball is attracted to the water? So we get up to this creek, and I thought, that's water, and if, if golf holds true, <laughs> you know. So I took out one of my starter discs. Sure enough, phew, phew, right. Oh, man. But I didn't, I didn't lose the good one, right? So at the end of the game, we're walking away, and I said, you know what? I'm going to tell you how good I am. I said, I am so good that I started with six discs, lost one in the water, and I'm still going home with six. He just started laughing. But that's how we are with God. We get deficient in the process, but he always makes up for our deficiencies. Always makes up for our deficiencies. Lastly, God's not wasteful. You know, in the Great Depression, there was a phrase that I'm, I'm probably sure that you heard, waste not, want not. You know what that tells me? That God gave enough provision that if you would just ad- adequately administer what he gave, what he gave is sufficient. We eat our fill, and even the scraps are enough to fulfill the next problem. Everything that God gives is usable. I love Westerns. I love the Cowboys and Indians. And I love the fact that Indians, when they would hunt buffalo, they used every part of the animal. Every part of the animal. There was no part of their anatomy that was unused or wasted. We can learn something from that. When we have the attitude, well, God owns it all, so it don't matter if we leave that lay. And Sometimes I wonder if we're not dishonoring God in our heart that we're so entitled that we won't take care of what he did provide. And if we won't honor what he did provide, why would he ever provide more? God does allow us to encounter problems. And as long as we're breathing his air, we're going to run into them. Or they're going to run into us. I have a few questions and then I want to pray for you. If you were asking yourself these questions, the first one would be, Self, what problem am I facing that I might bring God into today what problem am i dealing with that i should bring god into the problem secondly have i come to terms with my own inadequacy am i just trying to solve the problem myself or have i seen that what i bring to the solution is simply five biscuits and a couple of sardines And lastly, have I come to the conclusion that whatever God's solution is, it's going to involve me? How many has ever been through deliverance with me? How many has never been through deliverance with me? Write them down. Get them, get them, get them, get them. Just kidding. Um, there's many times where I'll deal with somebody and they're going through a real mess and their problems seem this, this huge. And I'll remind them, you know, you didn't get into this problem quickly. This problem evolved over time. So you walked through life into this situation until you just got to a point you couldn't go anymore. So if you walked into this problem, your solution is going to be to walk back out. 
What we want is we want God to come in, snatch us out of where we're at, translate us supernaturally to a great spot, and release us as though nothing had ever happened. God's solution in my heart and mind as I'm thinking about it right now, is never devoid of our participation. So the problem that you're facing, you are a part of the solution that God wants to use to fix it. He's not going to fix it on your behalf. He's going to use you in the mix to make it happen. How many of you have just been praying, asking God just to handle it? You don't want to get your hands dirty? God, just fix this, please. I'll, I'll, I'll work with you on the next one, but if you'll, just, if you'll do me a solid and just fix this one. How many of you have thought, I obviously can't bring enough to the table for it to make any difference anyway. See, it wouldn't have mattered if I brought 20 bucks to that toy store or if I'd have brought 50 cents. If mom or dad says, put what you got up on the counter, then I know that whatever I brought is going to be enough when it's conjoined with what they brought to the table. So the skill set that you can take home with you tonight and use tonight is this. You alone are not now or ever will be enough. Secondly, what you do have or can bring to this situation will always be inadequate and insufficient. Third, the problem in your life is meant to expose the deficiencies in your life, which is typically us. <laughs> And fourthly, God's solution is always to use us as part of the equation so that our faith is never built on the method, but on the Lord of the method. So God will always use you to be a part of the solution, though you may have what's seemingly the same problem, he'll use you in a different solution each time. You know how many times I've had to tell myself, I can't see not one way out of the jam that I'm in, but God's got a million and one that he just, I mean, he could randomly pick just any of them and they'll work. So I have to lean on his wisdom, not my understanding, and allow myself to be used as a cog in the wheel of the solution instead of thinking that I am the solution. This is free. For those of you that feel like you are the solution, you're the problem. Not only are you the problem, you are probably somebody else's problem, and God will use them as a part of the solution to fix you. Problems are opportunities to work with God. Problems identify issues problems are gateways to promotion problems are learning curves to new levels of trust in god and they are signs to others that with god all things are possible i have no doubt that i'm looking at a group of people even those that didn't raise their hands that are dealing with problems And if I was a betting man, I'd bet you that the problems are still in your life because you still somehow see yourself as the solution. Or you see God as the solution all by himself, void or devoid of your involvement. Either one of those will keep that problem in your life. Let me sign off and then let me really pray for you. For all of those that are catching this stream at any part of it, hopefully all of it, it's here for you to go back and peruse. We want to say thank you for joining with us. I pray that you're walking away with something that you didn't have before you saw what you saw. If you're looking to be a part of a family, we're looking to grow ours. We'd love to see you at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., Thursday evenings at 645 p.m. 
Until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.